Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the MOOC NPTEL course on Bioengineering and interface with Biology and Medicine. Today we have reached to the last lecture of this course. In last several lectures we have discussed about various biological processes associated with cell cycle, development, cloning, cell reprogramming. We have also discussed many other interesting uh, biological concepts in genetics and cell biology. We have seen how DNA tools and biotechnology is driven by lot of technological advancements, different techniques we have talked. We have also discussed about proteins and protein related technologies. In addition to these topics, I think it is very important for me to emphasize that there is a need to have ethics in research and publications. So, today we are going to talk about this topic which is not directly linked to the biology, but it is highly relevant when you are doing uh, science and research. These kind of discussions, these points are very important for you to remember. So, let us start today about ethics in research and publication. So, whether you make engineering devices, products, or scientific basic research, ethics in research and publication is of paramount importance. Remember the story of animal cloning? We talked about how the rise and fall of stars happened in the research of cell reprogramming and cloning. And you have seen also the various consequences of scientific misconduct. So, today let us analyze the reasons for scientific papers retractions. Let me take you to some examples and possible reasons that why scientists do perform these scientific misconduct. So, I have shown you here some of the examples of scientific paper retraction. You can see this paper from Nature Cell Biology. I have shown you another example here where another paper was retracted, one more example here and in this case even the co-authors were not aware of what were the issues happening and one of the co-author had mentioned that I was so shocked. In fact, I had absolutely no knowledge whatsoever on the actions taken by the corresponding author. So, I think it is very important that if you are part of a team, the corresponding author should inform all the co-authors about any development which are happening related to your scientific work and the publications. Let us now analyze and discuss what are the possible reasons for retraction of scientific papers? There are increasing number of scientific paper retractions happening which is really you know bad and alarming news. If you do the PubMed research in Jan 2018, they identified almost 9800 articles were retracted. The report from the office of research integrity and other published resources and additional retraction announcements are also happening in scientific journals which are also worth analyzing. In general PNAS they try to analyze what are the reasons for the scientific misconduct and why scientific papers are retracted as you can see in this slide in the uh, published article from PNAS. They try to analyze various reasons for possible retractions and found that while uh, a small number of papers almost 20 percent were because of some errors which has happened in the process, people have not made the, the knowing mistakes, but there are almost 67 percent scientific papers were retracted because of fraudulent cases could be suspected fraud, the duplicated publications or even plagiarism. It seems the image manipulation is one of the favorite area for the fraudulent researchers to manipulate and then to the changes in the results. I have shown you here a couple of examples. Let us look at here this image manipulation where 
a protein analysis is happening and the blot is actually manipulated. The shown here from the journal of cell biology paper on the left side the original image and on the right side you can see the manipulated image how the bands have been removed to look very different. So, image manipulation by adjusting brightness and contrast is another uh, area where lot of manipulations happen. As you can see on the left side the original image and right side the image which is manipulated just by changing the contrast how different these uh, bands are looking like. In the next slide you can see again uh, by changing the brightness and contrast even the, uh, the gel which has you know many contaminants could be you know avoided and just you know a single band is shown on the fourth panel in the right hand side in the image. Again you can see another example where original image was manipulated and now all the uh, bands which are visible in the lower side they have been re removed and now you can only see single band from the gel. Looking at the cell morphology cell uh, under microscopy again lot of manipulations happen. For example, enhancement of a specific area is shown here in the image which is manipulated on the right hand side. And now you can see that you know uh, some of the misrepresentation of microscopic images something shown on the top panel is uh, an image which is manipulated and now you know later on if you change the contrast you can see how this was manipulated. So, general science uh, they looked into the image manipulation very seriously and uh, their you know data and analysis showed that large number of uh, publications uh, have actually been retracted because of the manipulation in the images. And therefore, now you know many of these journals they have their editors and they have the you know uh, the technical team who also looks at the images quite uh, seriously uh, even before the manuscripts are being sent for the peer review process. So, the question is that you know if you are a, a you know a PI or the head of a lab and you do not have you know a very much experience about you know how to operate these you know photo imaging softwares or the photo editing softwares uh, you may not be able to you know uh, really make sense that you know what is exactly the, the correct image or what could be the manipulated image. Uh, so, one of the uh, researcher actually uh, mentions here in one of the blogs that my personal experience says that research supervisors and guides they also need to be trained to detect the manipulated pictures sometime because uh, you know the students can make these changes and manipulate this and even they may not be able to figure it out. So, it is really important that on one hand uh, you know uh, one should not make any of these kind of changes, but there should be a stringent peer review process involved where you can correct these kind of uh, any uh, suspected practices. So, what is acceptable practice for uh, presenting your data and the images? So, the acceptable practices to show your figure effectively of course, that is uh, accepted you do not want to show uh, you know just the raw image uh, without any uh, you know the cropping the background. Uh, however, if you are doing lot of color adjustments or color balance you should mention that in the figure legend that you have used these settings to change or modify this image. And of course, you can put the raw image original figure in the supplementary which is part of the manuscript and uh, a reader when they are reading it they can actually try to go back and look at the original image as well. So, what is research misconduct? The research misconduct is defined as fabrication, falsification or plagiarism in performing research or reporting research results. The initial science foundation has defined these guidelines for uh, defining the research misconduct. So, fabrication is making up results and recording or reporting them. Falsification is manipulating research materials equipment or processes or changing or omitting data or results such that the result is not accurately represented in research record. Plagiarism is appropriation of another person's idea processes results or words without giving them appropriate credit. Source for these definitions are used from National Science Foundation. So, what are the major types of scientific misconduct? One of them is publishing misconduct. Your data is ok, but one has performed unethical practices. For example, to do a clinical study 
the clinical trials, uh, the proper constraints were not used and there has been misuse of uh, the samples which are obtained. So, that is unethical practice which, which is a publishing misconduct. The research misconduct is that your data itself is fraudulent, the data was generated in a uh, wrong manner which is much more serious issue. Of course, any kind of misconduct is serious for that matter, but uh, changing data or representing in a different uh, form uh, is of course, much more serious. And there has been lot of you know analysis uh, in which way people have done misconducts uh, from different parts of the world. And if you can see here you know in this graph uh, from this paper where it shows that you know large number of uh, fraud or suspected uh, fraud papers uh, actually came from uh, USA. Uh, there are many countries uh, part of it including India. Uh, of course, you know USA is shown in the largest uh, uh, fraction not only because you know uh, there are lot of misconduct is happening, but mainly because there are large number of publications are coming from USA lot, lot of you know research is happening and therefore, is, you know uh, a fraction of that is also suspected frauds. Uh, people have found even plagiarism and duplicate publication in all of these categories uh, from almost all part of the world are actually uh, you know uh, involved in, in this kind of stuff which is not happening on any specific continent. Uh, and if you look at the journals where the most of these uh, articles have been retracted, uh, it is alarming to see that with the most prestigious journals including Science, PNAS, Nature, JBC, all of these journals uh, they have reported many uh, articles which were retracted. Uh, people have also tried to analyze that you know uh, what is the mean time to retraction by the category that how many years it usually takes for you know the uh, fraud to, to be figured out and the articles to get retracted. But you know the main question is that what is the probable cause of research misconduct? Is this the carrier pressure or looking at more sort of funding opportunities? Sometimes there is a hunger for reputation, it is very easy to fake than make. Many times that you, when you are part of a team which is you know let us say uh, as a student when you are competing for some you know competitions you are going to the international competitions and you are part of a team which is making some devices some sort of you know uh, robots and then at that time to be the first to be the top in the world I think you know if you uh, you know change your mind sometime and, and kind of you know uh, get engaged into any kind of uh, misconduct you are uh, using somebody's already original idea and trying to represent as your own I think that will probably lead to the misconduct which is uh, you know sometime that kind of pressure of whether it is carrier pressure or competition pressure I think should, should not affect your originality which is really crucial. Let us say you are working in a, in a research lab you now you are uh, as undergraduate students you are going to uh, work in a, in a scientific laboratory uh, you know of course you are most junior over there and there are you know many senior PhD students and the postdocs uh, they are all working in that lab. Uh, and you actually somehow get sense that you know something suspicious is happening, some sort of scientific uh, misconduct is happening in this lab. So, what should be your role? Uh, I think you know because you are uh, very junior that time uh, and you may not know exactly that you know what should be the best ethical practices for doing research. It is important that you can talk to your senior that you know uh, you you know feel that you know something uh, the way it is being done in this particular you know result which you are showing is not correct you know and this is my understanding you know please correct me if I am wrong. Uh, and let us say you know if sometime you are a senior and a, a junior student comes to the lab and now you are you know uh, finding that the junior is doing some mistakes and he is doing some sort of suspicious things and changing the data, changing the gel images and, and doing something which is you know just for the publication sake. Then I think it is your uh, you know responsibility to inform your seniors to inform your PI to the professor that you know something suspicious is happening and let them kind of you know decide what to be done. Let us think about extreme situation that your professor or the PI itself is actually engaged in some sort of uh, you know uh, plagiarism or these kind of suspicious activity of scientific misconduct that is very you know difficult situation because you as a student will actually hesitate to say that you know how to uh, handle this kind of situation. But I think it is still uh, your responsibility to go back and you know uh, either talk to the professor but if you do not have courage to do that you can actually inform your you know head of the department or the deans so that you know they can do investigation. Next question is you know what are the possible uh, consequences of scientific misconduct. I am sure in the context of discussion of the animal cloning you have seen that you know many of the researchers who were involved in doing the fraudulent work uh, their career got totally damaged, they lost employments 
uh, and these kind of retractions you know are, are very detrimental for the you know any uh, researchers career because they are always you know published they are always out that you know and the reasons are mentioned that you know what are the possible uh, misconduct reason in that paper. Uh, sometime you know authors could be even banned for uh, publishing for limited time. Uh, you have seen that in case of the you know the cloning story there were a lot of financial penalty were given in fact even imprisonment was also given. So, lot of you know uh, the consequences you will face if you uh, do the scientific misconduct. So, it is really important that you know uh, make sure that you know you are spending enough time to obtain the good results and you are not you know kind of in rush uh, doing the scientific misconduct. So, I must say that you know uh, it is uh, a very nice uh, statement made by National Academy of Science uh, in 1995 that someone who has witnessed the misconduct has an unmistaken obligation to act. So, if you see that some, you know, some misconduct is happening around you, you are part of a team which is going to compete in the international game and, and you feel that you know uh, one of your colleague is actually uh, you know doing some sort of misconduct. And if you do not report that just because you know uh, your friend is involved in doing that, that is not correct because you have to report that kind of misconduct if you are part of that team because every co-author or the every colleague of that particular work is going to be equally uh, you know involved in that kind of misconduct. So, it is really, really crucial for you to take act on this. I would like to acknowledge for this lecture uh, two of my colleagues from Department of Bioscience Bioengineering, Professor uh, Bhomik and Kunda Begel. Uh, who has provided me some very stimulating discussions and good references uh, for this kind of you know scientific misconduct based uh, you know various articles published in the last couple of years time. So, students I hope this course has now made you very much excited to study biology. Let us now review what we have learnt during these last 8 weeks. During the very first week you were introduced to the major life problems and how we require interdisciplinary skills to find effective solutions to these problems. We provided you examples of bio inspired engineering where designs and models based on lessons from biology have been developed to solve very complex human problems. We then briefly studied about the cell and its properties. A clinician Dr. Ali Esgar Moyadi was introduced who talked to you about brain tumors and how there is a need for engineering interventions for the medicine. During the week 2 you learnt about central dogma of biology and refreshed about the concepts of nucleic acids. We also learnt about the simple yet very crucial lab techniques like agarose electrophoresis and polymerase chain reaction. We further learnt about gene cloning both theoretically as well as the lab demonstration sessions where you have seen how to do the cloning, how to perform these molecular biology experiments in a laboratory settings. In week 3 we discussed about several biotechnology tools that are routinely used for addressing many biological problems. These tools included microarrays, RT-PCR and sequencing technologies. We learnt how DNA sequencing has revolutionized the field of modern molecular biology and paved the way for next generation sequencing. Furthermore, we learnt how these DNA tools are being used for many applications such as food production as well as in plant biotechnology. We also got clinical insights from Dr. Nikhil Fertke, one of the clinician who uses these tools for patient care to provide better diagnostic and prognostic information to individuals with genetic defects, cancer and infectious diseases. During the fourth week, we dedicated our time for Mendel's experiment, especially pea plants. We discussed the two Mendelian laws of genetics the real life examples of Mendelian genetics as well as cases where there is a deviation from the Mendelian genetics. In the last lecture of the fourth week, we introduce you to Dr. Jainti Shastri, a microbiologist who provided her perspective on needs of a clinician. 
she emphasized on the needs for the point of care test which could help to diagnose a disease at the bedside. Next in the fifth week we continued discussing about Mendel's observation and we moved on to Morgan's elegant experiment on genetics. We learned how Mendelian inheritance has its physical basis in the behavior of chromosomes. We further studied the molecular basis of inheritance and learned that DNA is the genetic material through various experiments. You are then briefly introduced to basics of bacteria and viruses. You learned how to perform experiments to distinguish the gram positive and gram negative bacteria. This week was concluded with another motivating session from a clinician Dr. Kunal Sehgal who heads the Sehgal pathology labs. The week 6 familiarized you with the basic concepts of cell cycle and key points where the cell might lose the control and often cause disease like cancer. We also learnt about several stages of an embryo and other key concepts which are related to the development of an organism. We also learnt the concepts of animal cloning and then the lessons on evolution was given to you to appreciate the diversity of the life and also gave you the scope to explore the field of population genetics. Furthermore, this week we had Dr. Mala Kaneria from Nair Hospital who again gave you a very stimulating talk on need of engineers to work towards technology solutions that can help doctors like her. Next week which was week 7 we started talking about basics of amino acids and proteins. You were introduced to several protein separation technologies such as SDS page, two dimensional electrophoresis and chromatography. You also had a hands on session on bioinformatics where you learnt how to study genes, proteins and evolutionary relationships. From this week then we moved to the last week, the week 8 where we had major focus on protein separation technologies and proteomic technologies. So, in this week we performed few experiments which gave you the a good understanding that how advancements in uh, protein technologies are now able to provide us a comprehensive overview of various complex physiological processes. We learnt how protein microarrays and label free technologies like surface plasma resonance can aid our understanding for studying protein interaction networks and finding their kinetics to provide us better understanding. So, the aim of this course was to encourage you all to see biology in a very different way. We hope now you agree that biology is much more than just a subject. There is a lot of a scope for biology and engineering to coexist and bioengineering can offer many unique solutions that can be useful for agriculture, medicine, health and many other applications. Thus, I hope you are now motivated to learn more about these tools and the areas of bioengineering. Before I finish, let me thank the NPTEL head and technical team for all the support in bringing this course to the students on time. I would also like to acknowledge all the course TAs for their very high quality work. Many thanks to my students of IIT Bombay BB 101 course as they keep motivating me to teach biology course to engineers with their very naive but very interesting questions. Also a note of gratitude to the members of my proteomics lab who have enhanced the course by their lab demonstrations. We need you and your skills to tackle many research problems. Let us continue this journey together.